Welcome to Leader Lessons Now podcast with weekly conversations on leadership lessons for new leaders to develop their self-awareness and help those they lead to a better future. Now, here's your host. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. We are starting a new book titled Leadership in Turbulent Times. This is from Doris Kearns Goodwin and winner of Pulitzer Prize. It's got a lot of accolades here. Also number one New York Times business bestseller. And the, uh, the publisher is Simon & Schuster Paperbacks with copyright 2018. So I dived into this pretty quickly and had to take a step back because it is definitely dense enough to be rich in context uh, context and then rich in kind of what what uh, lessons to pull out of it <clears throat> so so this is not going to be like the other two books i reviewed recently which was kind of like a quick overview and then you know kind of a couple of key takeaways i think here the nuggets are deeper and require a little bit more context and maybe a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit of opinion as well, so that we can sort of pull out of the depth in order to get some keen insights that are relevant for today. So I start with the forward, and that is to outline the book into three parts. Part one is about these four men: Abraham Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, and Lyndon Johnson and their lives and times um, that have occupied the, the thought of the author over the last half a century. So certainly an author that is well uh, established in, in, in these leaders and calling herself a historian. But, in, but part one is kind of the beginning stages of these leaders and how they came into being into public life and their public identity and how they, you know, are, are different in each way. And then part two gets into the dramatic reversal uh, that shattered the private and public lives of all four men and the different stages. Examples are, you know, this uh, going through, I think of this kind of like midlife sort of big struggles where Theodore Roosevelt lost his young wife, Abraham Lincoln suffered, you know, his pub, um, a blow to his public reputation, that led to near suicidal depression. Franklin Roosevelt struck by polio and Lyndon Johnson losing his election to the United States Senate. So part two is kind of like, you know, the devastation. And then part three is taking the four men to the White House and the, the being guided by a sense of moral purpose and how they channeled their ambitions to summon their talents to enlarge the opportunities in the lives of others. So this, there's sort of this graduation for each part and part one takes us into the ambition and recognition of leadership into chapter one with Abraham Lincoln. I like how it begins, which is every man is said to have his peculiar ambition. And for Abraham Lincoln, it was him saying, I have no other so great as that of being truly esteemed of my fellow men by rendering myself worthy of their esteem. And what a, what a great uh, thought in terms of what a leader should be, and that is to render your own worth by being esteemed by others. And this is, this is the reflection, right, where leadership is a mirror of the people and the collective reflection. And so that is, that is the servant mentality. So it, that's interesting. And if, and if we start kind of walking through his history, the springboard for Lincoln's ambition was from the poor and of his youth. And so this, this poverty and this kind of self-development out of poverty is at the core of who Abraham Lincoln was. And this motivation and willpower to develop every talent he possessed to his fullest. So it's a, it's a moral story about... Abraham Lincoln and sort of coming out of poverty and, uh, you know, battling sort of his father wanting his fa his father wanting him to stay on the farm and um, his his mom dying at a young age. And so having to work hard sort of with his body, but then also really challenging himself to 
digest information from whatever source he could get it from, primarily books, and then and then to try and convey what he's learning with others that upon first appearance is this lanky guy, you know, with this this ink black hair and kind of high cheekbones and kind of a kind of a weird looking guy. Uh, but 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 he's able to articulate words by what he's reading and he's able to see how people are receiving his words. And when he uses stories and humor, it allows people to learn lessons in a more relaxed way and in, and in turn uh, takes that information and changes behaviors. And so a pretty a pretty interesting you know awareness uh, of a 20 year old who, who doesn't have all the same, uh, you know, uh, opportunities as maybe those that are more wealthy and having to kind of, uh, work his way through knowledge and work his way, uh, to an understanding that he wanted something more for himself than what he currently was being presented. And that sums up nicely in a nice little sentence here where the author says, He, Abraham Lincoln, understood early on that concrete examples and stories provide the best vehicles for teaching. But what stood out to me was that his attitudes weren't merely moral postures, but as a young boy, he had the profound sense of empathy and the ability to put himself in the place of others, to imagine their situations and and to identify with their feelings. So it's that it's that willpower to develop your talent to its fullest and understand where you have opportunities to develop talent and you begin to work on it rigorless, rigorously while also uh, having the empathy for others and not using that power of knowledge to domineer, but to understand and to help others grow. He made things happen instead of waiting for them to happen. Uh, he was one that was engulfed by sadness and was pretty revealing of this melancholy side of his temperament. Uh, there was quotes about his melancholy being dripped from him as he walked. Yet if the melancholy was part of his nature, so too was the life-affirming humor that allowed him to perceive what was funny or ludicrous in life. And it was this vision of an alternative future that was really driving him to to do the work that needed to be done. And that was the work of the farm and the work at home and the physical work. But it, but it was the, the drive for knowledge to better himself in so that he could uh, gain the esteem of, of those around him and those he served. So went on to talk a little bit about, you know, getting his job as a clerk and bookkeeper in a general store in New Salem. And, um, you know, it, and you know, everybody loved him. He had this sort of spontaneous, unobtrusive hand and was always uh, caring and open and candid, obliging and honest and good natured. And so the sociability, you know, if you look at or at least read uh, this upbringing, it's this humility of not thinking you're better than, but then also being able to get beyond your own pain to be able to unobtrusively help others in good nature. And, and that really takes, you know, that really takes an obliteration of ego in order to move into that, that frame of reference. And I think for, at least for Lincoln, there's this early trauma that sort of eliminated that. And then interestingly, it's almost like him trying to get it back with, with this building of knowledge, building of self and trying to gain the esteem of those around him. But when he, when he ran for the member of the Whig party, and this is in his early twenties, uh, it was predominantly democratic. He stood for four central ideas, uh, the creation of a national bank, protective tariffs, governmental support for internal improvements and an expanded system of public education. And it was really the governmental support for internal improvements and education that is where he st- he made the most ground. But he always had a willingness to acknowledge his errors and learn from his mistakes. And, and I like this. There was this quote about, you know, he, he wouldn't feel defeated unless it occurred five or six times. Then he would, then he would deem it a disgrace and and be certain ever to try it again. And so there was this kind of resilience to a promise of ambition that I thought was really um, at the heart of what it takes to be a great leader. 
And I'm trying to pick up nuggets here because it's a, it's very historical. And I want to, again, stay true to the idea of trying to review the book. And that is what, what parts of these leaders are still relevant today. And that may, that may need to be highlighted again in our turbulent times, especially in 2020. And one of these is uh, Lincoln knowing when to wait and when to act uh, as part of his leadership skill there's also a nice outline about, you know, what happens when you have two opposing parties and it results in argument, attacks. And this time it was the atmosphere was so wrought with with lawlessness that people would pull out guns and it would burst into fist fights. And so one of the ways that Lincoln was really effective was that he was using good humored Uh, uh, good humor to rally members of both parties and they couldn't help but laugh and relax in the pleasure of his entertaining and well-told stories. There's also a nice example of where Lincoln's moral courage and convictions outweighed his ferocious ambition in the, in the, in in the voting against the institution of slavery, which he felt was founded on both injustice and bad policy And at that time, to be somebody that was against slavery, and here he is at the age of 26, was pretty uh, condemning and uh, could have ruined his future, but he stayed true to his beliefs um, early on. And he also felt like uh, he learned from his father a maxim that if you make a bad bargain, hug it tighter. And that was you know, even upon failure, really understand it, embrace it, learn from it and keep it close to you because it served you to learn more about yourself, which I really liked. So it ends the chapter with a nice sentence I'll read. And that is in less than a half a dozen years, seemingly from nothing and from nowhere, he had risen to become a respected leader in the state legislature, a central figure in the fight for internal improvements and an instrumental force behind the planting of the new capital and a practicing lawyer. And I, and I think this idea of him, you know, being part of the ordinary people to get, and in that belief, he really believed that people could govern themselves. And that's how you succeed in knowing that the institution is just a reflection of the people and is the people. And uh, so I really loved I really love that uh, first chapter. And the next one takes us into Theodore Roosevelt. Thanks for listening to Leader Lessons Now. Check back weekly for new episodes and please subscribe to this channel if you want to stay updated on the latest leadership lessons.